Hi, everyone. Hope you're not too you know, sleepy from digesting. Um, yeah, I'm Vanessa. I'm marketing director at Load Impact. Uh, Load Impact is a performance testing software as a service. So we both have developers of APIs as customers, as well as have our own API. So I kind of have a twofold uh, perspective on this. Um, so I was invited to talk about growth, ha growth hacking APIs and what role does an API play in your growth strategy. So what, there was sort of three questions when I was thinking about the abstract that I really wanted to address. So what role do APIs play in your growth strategy? What do you do when your API needs growth hacking? And what do you do when your API is a growth hack? Um, so first, we're going to just take it back and understand what growth hacking is. It's a fancy word for product marketing. <laughs> it's usually characterizing people who work with digital products, but it's essentially product marketing. Um, and what the role is, is somebody who's really focused on um, manipulating and measuring each aspect of the customer funnel. And the customer funnel is essentially this. Acquisition, you know, for a lot of us who have the companies that we have, we acquire, you know, we put, bring people at the top of the funnel. Usually they'll come in, they'll sign up for something, we'll acquire, interest from prospective users or customers. We activate them, so a certain percentage of them will then bond with your service in some way. They'll take some sort of initial step to really start to experience the value of what you provide. Retention, so you keep them over a long term. So that's both retention in terms of usage and retention in terms of spending. Um, and then, you know, revenue, do you, how, you know, what percentage of those convert to paying customers. And then, of course, happy paying customers refer your service to others, which then fill up the top of the funnel, um, and you're able to acquire more customers. So Growth Hackers really is concerned about this, these sort of stages and understanding how, how people behave when they come in, they're acquired through one channel or another, um, what, you know, what part of your service they're using. Um, yeah, so basically you're trying to understand how people move from one stage to the other and getting as many people to move from one stage to the other as possible. Um, so the intersection between growth hacking and marketing is this. Marketing traditionally, I'm not sure how many marketers actually do it this way anymore, with being an art and instinct driven. With the data we have available to us today, it's very, it's very rarely like this. Um, so now where it's kind of overlapped is around content marketing. and I, you probably have heard about this in one way or another. That's really sort of building your, your company's pers like n expertise through content. So white papers, even your documentation when you're talking about your API, that's part of your content marketing strategy. Um, you're doing a lot of, uh, yeah, you're doing a lot of content in some form or another, video, written, even events is part of like a content marketing strategy. Then you get into the growth hacking side, which is really specifically about looking at your product itself and what you can do to sort of tweak it so that it's more engaging, it's more viral. Um, it, it allows people to easily sort of with a click of a button refer it to a colleague. You're sort of working with product data um, and classical sort of digital tools to get it to be yeah, more retaining, more engaging, and more viral. Um, and it's typically, growth hacking is typically used, or it's typically characterizing somebody who is on a small budget. So it's often used by startups, but I mean, it can be used by large companies as well. It's just, it is often for uh, those who are limited by budget. So I wanted to start off to understand that, you know, th that sort of classical funnel model, although it's really useful to, you know, think about the journey, it's, this is the way we see it as IT vendors. It's typically like this. Um, the journey is complex. There is a lot of people involved. There's a lot of back and forth. You know, you'll think a developer who's considering your API for whatever usage is going to talk to their, their CTO, they're going to talk to their peers, so forth. They're going to consult different content that you put out, your competitors put out, industry analysts put out. All that to say, it's not, it's not so linear in reality. Um, and like I said, there is a lot of people involved in the process. And I think when you have really your API as a service, your infrastructure as a service, understanding that it is a complex buy often and that there are different people that are strongly influencing the decision to use your service. There's the initiator, characterizes the person who usually identifies the need for, for that service. Users who are the ones who are going to implement. So in a lot of our cases, a developer influencers, as well as the decider, typically the decider being the one with 
holding the money. But in, in, our, in our situation, the user is often the decider or heavily, heavily influences the final decision. So the way I wanted to frame this was to work off last year, um, Guillaume Ballas from 3Scale presented typologies of an API. And I thought this was a great way to start the framing and then apply sort of the marketing perspective to it. So he broke up APIs in three typologies. Your API is your product and your strategy. So that's like Twilio, that's infrastructure. The product is infrastructure. Your API projects the product. That's um, where your API extends the functionality to new places. Um, so I'm going to use load impact as an example. Um, Salesforce is another example. I merged um, Guillaume's typologies, the, he had four. I merged the third one into two. So power and promotes the product. Powers meaning um, like Facebook or Twitter. Their API is used to build widgets and things that get more content into their network. So their API is able to like power that content. That content adds value to the experience of Facebook, obviously. And promotes it is sort of the outbound. Um, if you think of um, YouTube, Google Maps, it's, the API allows it to be sort of distributed into other places. So the first typology is the most complex. So your core value is infrastructure. Your growth metric is core service usage growth. So your core growth metric is, what, when you bring it back to that funnel I talked about, it's activation. You're looking for calls to your API. That is your growth metric that you're primarily concerned with. Use case is APIs for partners, enables new business models. I think that's clear. The marketing is complex. You need to know how all those people in the decision-making process um, usually you come in top down as well as bottom up. So it's, it is the most complex um, typology from a marketing perspective. The second one is projects the product. So your, your core value is a software and application. Your first growth metric is to increase customer spend. So your API is, to, is there to make your core service stickier and to get people to spend more, get your customers to spend more. Your second objective is to get more people using your core service. Like I said, this typology extends the software functionality, um, allows sort of programmatic, programmatic access to your course, your course or service. The marketing is very much focused on the developer, the end user of your API, um, showing how they can customize it, how they can use it to integrate with other tools they're using, um, and it's really an emphasis on the developer experience. The third typology powers and promotes. So you've got Yelp, Facebook, YouTube as examples. So the core value here is the network. These are what I like to call marketplaces. They're often two-sided. So there is either you know, high value or a certain amount of user-generated content, and there's often a large user base. Um, the growth metric for these, these type of typologies is getting more people using the core service. So this is acquisition, getting as many people using um, using the service. That's, that's the objective of, of having an API and the distribution of their API. The second is increasing customer spend. Um, the use case is, for example, an API enables widgets that help market the core service. If you think about all the widgets Facebook creates that I as a marketer use on any website blog to like this, uh, comment through Facebook, all those ways that Facebook creates those so that more content comes on to Facebook. Um, yeah, so the API enables creation of user-generated content, which adds value to the core service. Um, marketing, the API is enabling marketplace with network effects. So that means the API is only as valuable as the number of users in that marketplace and or the amount of content that's being up for consumption in that marketplace. Um, the marketplace becomes increasingly dominant when third parties build on top of that API. If you think about the App Store, you really have to be dominant to get to that stage. It's almost, you're becoming a typology one at that point. That's like Facebook. You're, they're, they're massive. Their marketplace is the marketplace. So people are now building their entire businesses off their API. So just to kind of sum it up, so we recap. So API typology one, product is infrastructure. Core growth metric is calls to the API's activation. Um, the strategy is focus on uh, use cases for your API and understand the different people in the buying process. The other one where your API is the growth hack. The, first, the, the second one is the typology around the product as a software and application. The primary growth metric is increasing customer spend. And the marketing strategy is to target developers, the users of the core service. The third typology is also where your API is a growth hack. Your product is the network, a marketplace. You're primarily 
concerned with increasing the size of the marketplace, getting more people using the core service, so getting more users or getting more content into the marketplace. Um, you're primarily targeting developers, of course, but as well as product managers of apps and websites that would benefit from programmatic access to the user base or programmatic distribution of the content that's found in your, your marketplace. Key is data in, data out. So if you plot that against that funnel that I talked about at the beginning, you can kind of see. So typology one, so like Twilio and Stripe, their main, remember, all, all the, the whole funnel is important, so I'm not sort of trying to say that the other stages are not important, it's what your API is primarily, from a growth perspective, concerned about. So typology one, it's confirmed with activation, calls to the API. Typology two, it's revenue. Like, loaded back to our, our, our API is there so that it's stickier. It, you know, people can access it programmatically to our core service. It's really to drive sort of retention and, and revenue. Um, and the third typology is about acquisition. It's really about growing that marketplace. Emphasis that retention and referral are always goals, growth goals, because basically if you can't return your retain your customers and they don't promote you, they don't have positive things to say about you, you're going to fail anyway, so there's, <laughs> there's really no point. Um, so what do you do when your API needs a growth hacking? So typology one, um, where your product is infrastructure. Um, I tried to break it up into steps. So the first one is focus this is if you're early stage, by the way, when you are sort of minimal budget. So you focus on use cases for your API that you can serve particularly well, improving security, facilitating communication, processing payments. Try to find a, a use case and ideally match it with a vertical, an industry that you can really serve well um, and start sort of start there. Profile all the people in the decision-making process for that particular use case and industry. What do they want? What's holding them back? Who are they? Really sort of profile them clearly. Third one, create content. I talked about content marketing. Create content that addresses the concerns of those different people. Um, case studies, documentation, code examples for the developers, how-tos, testimonials, referrals. Content that addresses all of those. Start to create sort of a, a database of content that addresses all those different people. But all content's not for everybody. You don't want to get to a giant website where it's like, you know, you're the developer and suddenly you're presented with testimonials from a CEO and all things, you're, you know, you're the developer, you're looking for the, the documentation, code examples, or code libraries. So work, there are tools available, marketing automation, redirects, webhooks, things that drive, pe drive the specific different people to the right content. So that you're, yeah, basically you're the message that you want to get clear to those people is what they see and they're not sort of distracted by a lot of other things. Um, so that includes hackathons from an event perspective, developer portal, things like that. So what do you do when your API is a growth hack? So the second typology, where it projects the product. Your main target is the developer. And your growth metric is increasing spend. First, price your service so that it accommodates for API usage. Be cautious about overages and access fees, as that will likely limit usage. So just be careful how you price it. Think about how an API user, in this sense, is using it and make sure that you're pricing your product accordingly. Um, create, distribute, maintain code libraries, SDKs, and plugins in the languages and the platforms that your users use. It's kind of obvious. Um, create clean and easy to use documentation. Um, documentation that implicitly addresses developers' unique use case. So integrated um, code examples. Build confidence in the stability, security, and scalability of your API. Be transparent about incidents, how you handle them. Communicate regular maintenance and updates. Perhaps even commit to service level agreements, terms of service, failover measures. Um, and consider releasing a high quality open source component um, built on your API. It showcases your engineering strength. Um, and sort of builds brand equity amongst developers. It's the sort of way to use GitHub as an advertising tool. Um, that's one way you can sort of think about it. Um, and I took, I added this on after last, the last section. Reward and acknowledge reaching high competence level. And that was off uh, the last talk. Um, then the third typology, you're of course still targeting the developer, but you're also targeting product managers. So price for this one is also very careful, but price is usually free because your objective here is to get the content that's in your marketplace out or get content in and users in. So you really, you just want people to use your, use your widgets, use your API, build off of it. So you typically have a free business model. 
again, uh, it's widgets, SDKs, but as well as widgets and plugins that are, um, can be implemented by non-technical people. So, for example, myself. I use widgets by Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I, I need to be able to implement those as a non-technical person, but someone who's often managing a lot of the product or the, the sort of user interfacing sections of our service. Uh, documentation still, security and stability are of course still important, as well as potentially releasing an open source component to show your sort of engineering might. So, to bring it all back, the questions that we wanted to address were what role do APIs play in your growth strategy? And the answer is, it depends on the typology of your API. So understand, try to find that typo which typology you fall under. It's possible you can fall under several, but just know which ones. So your, your, your API is playing a role either for acquisition, activation, or revenue growth. What do you do when your API needs growth hacking? So that first typology, focus on use cases, profile the different people in the decision-making process, create content, and segment that content so that it only reaches the, the right people at the right time. Um, we can have a separate talk on some tools you can use to actually do that. I know that sounds complex. It sounds complex, but it's actually a lot easier than you think to deliver the right content to the right people at the right time. Um, when your API is a growth hack, price your service carefully, work with SDKs, widgets, plugins, code examples, clean and use documentation, build confidence in your API, um, and think about releasing an open source component to showcase your engineering strength. That's actually it. I thought I went really fast, but <laughs> um, do I have how many? I had three minutes. Does does anyone want me to kind of elaborate on something? I got three minutes because <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Anything in particular? Which tools? Oh, yeah, okay, so let me go back to uh, segmenting and delivering. Um, okay, so you're going to drive traffic in a number of ways. You're going to use content, and you're going to use AdWords, per perhaps. You're going to use PR in a way where you get people to write articles about you, or you encourage people to write content. Make sure that the links that you embed in the, that content, the AdWords, the blog post, link to, it, rel it relates back to the content that's there, and it links to landing pages that relate. So if it's a blog post or an ad word that is talking to the developers, don't make them land on maybe you know, the home page that has everything or land on the, 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 the landing pages that are directed towards the sort of the business end of it. You're gonna funnel in people from specific places. You just look at your Google Analytics to understand that and try to sort of make the links land on the relevant places. Um, there's something called marketing automation, which is basically what it sounds like. You install a cookie on the first time of their visit, you gather certain information about them, the next time they come back, they land on a different place that's more relevant to them. That's marketing automation. So that is possible, and there's a lot of companies that serve that if you're looking for that. Um, so that you can customize the experience every time you learn something new about them. You can also automate emails. So because we, have, we all have services or products that we, we have a lot of data about usage, so I know, you know, I know if a user has used this certain feature. I know a little bit about who they are as a company because I asked company and industry when they signed up. So I can match those things and I can send an automated email triggered by some event that caters to that, that person because of the industry, because of the features they've used in my product. I don't send them useless, irrelevant messages. Um, yeah, that's basically it. So think research marketing automation. I think that's probably the most broad category when we're talking about this. And that is automating that flow and making sure that you're, you're showing the right messages to the right people at the right time. Yep. I look into companies called HubSpot, Marketo. Um, yeah, there's a few others, but HubSpot and Marketo are probably good examples. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa.